Coming up next, I'm super excited to invite Holden. Holden is an open source software developer who specialized in Apache Spark. And a fun fact about Holden, she runs a scooter club called the Sparkling Pink Pandas. Hi, Holden. Hi. Yeah, I, I really like my scooter club. If anyone's in San Francisco and looking for a scooter club to join after the pandemic is over, like, give me a shout. Absolutely. After the pandemic is over, we're all going to run into the sparkling pink pandas and dress accordingly, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and together with Holden, I would like to invite Cheryl Adams. Cheryl Adams is a data architect, and she recently launched a new podcast. Cheryl, would you like to share about your podcast? Yeah, I'm so excited to be able to do this. I'm doing this podcast as talking about uh, mental health. I'm a huge mental health advocate, so I tell short stories about how we can manage some of life's everyday difficulties. So I'm super excited about it. I'm getting a lot of positive responses back. Amazing. Well done. Well, we all definitely need more uh, to care about ourselves a little bit more during this time as well. Uh, all right, Holden and Cheryl, take it away. The stage is yours. Hey, Holden, how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, you too. So exciting. Um, let's jump in and let's start talking about um, big data. Now, you and I kind of chatted about this before, but you told me that you think big data and AI traditionally didn't play together very well. How do you think that's changed? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening here. Um, one of them is the introduction of things like Apache Arrow that makes it possible for, for tools to work together. Um, and that's just like traditionally, uh, a lot of the AI tools have been built in Python. Um, for a variety of reasons. And a lot of the big data tools have been built in the JVM. And so with things like Arrow, uh, we're finding it easier for these big data tools mm -hmm. to work together uh, with the AI tools. And this is super important because there's that uh, sort of, there's the thing where the unreasonable power of uh, large sample sizes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so amazing algorithms on small amounts of data are, are kind of limited. Um, and so this is this is really cool, and we're we're seeing this even in Spark, where Apache Arrow is now accelerating right. the user-defined right. functions, um, and and it's really great to see these things being able to work together. Um, and Spark has also added uh, a new uh, scheduler uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, right. for example, right. it, traditionally in in things like Spark and, and and other things of this nature, like if you lose one piece of data, you can just recompute that piece of data. Uh, okay. But if you're doing like something like uh, iterative machine learning algorithm, if you lose one partition, right, like you can't always just recompute that partition, right? It's more like a wide transformation. Right. And so you have to do a different kind of scheduling. And so I think we're starting to see these tools start to work together. And we're also seeing uh, big data tools being made in Python itself without yes. depending on the JVM. And I'm really excited for that, uh, even though it means that I have a lot of stuff to learn. Um, right. But that's that's okay. Uh, I really, I love learning new things. So that's great. And and I'm excited to learn a whole bunch of new stuff as well. So there's, there's things like Dask, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also things like Ray. And these things are, are sort of Python first tools right. that are pretty awesome. Uh, but I think they're, they've got a lot of potential. Uh, and they also integrate a lot more with sort of traditional uh, machine learning tools. So if you look at Dask, right. for example, it has a mm -hmm. much closer integration with scikit-learn. Man, all of that sounds so exciting. And I can, and we're gonna touch a little bit later about the ability to kind of pivot and learn new things. And speaking of new things, let's talk about Spark. There's so much going on with Spark. What can you tell us? What are you excited about? Yeah, so there are so many cool things that I'm excited about um, in, in Spark. And of course I'm biased because I work on Spark uh, right. a lot. So I think the things that I'm working on are super cool. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I'll start with that. Uh, so one of the things that I'm really excited about in Spark, uh, specifically in the next version that'll come out sometime early next year, okay. is uh, we finally have, <clears throat> sorry, my, my apologies, oh, out no of the worries. ability to um, have intelligent 
uh, dynamic scaling on Kubernetes. I think this is really important because we're seeing a lot of people migrate away from Yarn onto Kubernetes right, clusters. Right. Uh, another thing that I think is really cool is, you know, when when Spark was first made, it, it it had the very reasonable assumption that like, hey, you know, we have to cover the situation of node failures, but node failures mm -hmm. they're not going to be super common, right? Like we right. need to we need to handle them, but yes. it's not going to be an all the time thing. Uh, but now that people are running more in situations where preemption is a thing, um, and that's often in the cloud, uh, you like things that look like node failures, they're not actual failures, but you're being preempted, okay. are super important. And they actually happen at much higher rates than, than historically mm. uh, Spark was built around. And so we've added support for doing more intelligent things when we know that we're going to be losing executors. Uh, and so I think that's really cool. And I think we're right. going to start to see a lot more efficient use of resources. So I think that's, that's really awesome. So yeah, there's so much going on. And like you said, there's a lot to learn. And, and the interesting thing about technology is that it just keeps changing. So you can't stay in place and say, I only know this one thing because yeah. all of a sudden there's a new release, there's a new enhancement where well, we're always improving. <clears throat> and speaking about that, and you mentioned machine learning. So I want to kind of step lightly into that space because I know it's pretty broad. Can yeah. you talk about what's happening with the reproducible machine learning pipeline? That's totally. Really fascinating. So I, okay, I, I have a lot of feelings here. Um, and most of it comes from having written untitled uh, dash four dash final dash v2 dot ipython notebook uh, far too many times in my life. Okay. Um, and I think I think it's really cool that we have uh, better tools. Not that not that Python notebooks are bad, uh, but we've got tools to productionize them now. And and I think it's one of those things where often when we see sort of an idea that is hitting its time, uh, we'll go from having not many tools to having many right. different tools to do the same thing at the same time. Right. Um, and so Apache Airflow is really coming into its own. And we also see the same thing with Kubeflow coming into its own. And in fact, Kubeflow now actually supports uh, multiple execution environments because now there's so many different kinds of execution environments for pipelines. Um, right. And I think what's really cool with, with sort of Kubeflow's approach is that uh, it's sort of like this, you can specify your pipelines in Python, compiles down to like YAML. Um, but the the really mm -hmm. cool thing is it's sort of this focus on containerization, right? Right. Because we have this thing where, you know, it works on my machine. Uh, yes. And that, that that's, I, that's been okay for a long time, right? right? But now that we're starting to make really, really important business decisions on this stuff, we can't mm -hmm. just depend on, you know, uh, the you know, data scientists to come in on every right. Tuesday and update their model. We actually need that to run on a predictable schedule and we, we need to know if it breaks. And so right. I think some of the really cool stuff here is that um, we've got pipelines, but we also are starting to see monitoring tools being built. Oh yes. Um, mm -hmm. And in Kubeflow, like one of the things that I think is really, really lovely about their, their pipelines and specifically their examples is uh, it includes stuff like even in their examples, like, hey, run the pipeline, and now we're going to validate the model that we built. Um, because that's a really important step that a lot of people mm -hmm. have been doing manually. And so when they go to productionize their their pipelines, they, they aren't right. always doing. Um, and so I think, and of course, I'm a little biased about Kubeflow because I wrote a right. book about Kubeflow, uh, yeah. which I think is, of course, the gift of the holiday season. Okay. Um, good plug, good plug. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I really think that we should buy several copies of uh, my latest book. Um, and if even if the person doesn't know, you know, anything about computers, their cat will love, will love okay. the box that it comes in. Right, right. <laughs> well, that's great. And we know we all love our pets. They've definitely been essential in this uh, pandemic season. Maybe we might be getting on their nerves, but we certainly love all of them and, and their presence. So that's great. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about as you talked about all these different technologies is I want to kind of touch on the learning experience. Because, yeah. Um, 
you know, I know that as as we continue to learn, you know, as a, as a content developer um, here at Microsoft, I'm I'm constantly learning and testing new technology. I want to know what is your secret to stay relevant in all this space with everything changing so much? What worked for you? What doesn't? Totally. So there are so many things which have not worked for me. Um, but so so one of the things is I, I love tutorials. I think they're great. Mm -hmm. I think like getting to play with something is really good. Yes. But I, I think that there's a there's a mindset that I only learned later on in my life that I really need to have when I'm picking up tutorials. Uh, and that mm -hmm. is that I'm going to do this tutorial, but I'm doing this tutorial to fix it or to make it better. Right. Wow. And that's because these things are changing Ooh. so quickly. Um, right. And if I go in with the mindset like, hey, I'm going to help this person update this tutorial, I pay a lot better attention. And right. also then, like when I get frustrated and things are broken, I, I find that I get less frustrated. And it's just like, oh, cool. This is the thing that I'm going to fix. It's OK right. that I'm going to spend like two days on this step, which originally would have taken me like five minutes, but everything has changed underneath me. Right. So I think right. having this mindset um, that it's a community and we're going to contribute to mm -hmm. improving the, the like resources that. is yes. really, really important when you're picking up open source tutorials. Um, I love that. I love that perspective. That's really great. Yeah, I have it's it's totally changed my interaction with tutorials. Um mm -hmm. and it's it's really lovely. I, I think I think it's great. Of course, also I think books are amazing. Right. Um oh, okay, cool. And we we have a question from the community, but so we'll we'll great. So um the, the community is suggesting uh, asking to suggest good documentation for Ray. Um, and so, so Ray is one of the Python data tools that we were talking mm -hmm. about yes. sort of briefly earlier. Um, and so for a little bit of context, uh, Ray has come out of not exactly the same lab, but pretty close to the same lab that Spark came right. out of. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I don't work on Ray a lot personally, I, I know some of the people involved with it. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of different resources for Ray. I think one of the things that's really important with uh, early stage technologies like Ray is to join their Slack channel. Um, oh yeah. And that's just yeah. because things are changing so quickly um, mm -hmm. that even when you go and you have this learning mindset or fixing mindset with right. any of their resources, there's a good chance that you're going to get stuck and it's just not going right. to work. Um, oh yeah. And, and, and being stuck and not having anyone to talk to, like even, even if you horrible. are trying to fix things, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yes. So step one, go and join the Ray Slack. Um, then there, there are some good tutorials. And, uh, so Dean, uh, made some excellent resources. And so if you search for Dean Wampler Ray, you can find some good stuff there. Um, but Ray itself also has some good tutorials. Right. Uh, I've found for me that with projects that are sort of at the phase where Ray is though, um, what's really important is just honestly checking out the code. Um, right. And that's because the, the the documentation and the releases are just not in sync at all. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that totally makes sense, right? They're focused on moving their, their project forward because that's what they have to be, right? right. Um, and so often uh, with, with Ray, for example, like the documentation is generated on what is in the current development branch, but the release, right. it, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, right. And so when I was trying to get Ray working on Kubernetes, that was an issue that I ran into. But by joining the Slack, I was able to find out like, hey, right. the reason why I'm running into these issues is like, I really need to be running from source. I can't be running the latest stable release. I right. need to be running from source. Right. Um, I love the, the mention of Slack. I think that's such a, a great resource. I too have joined Slack channels and I love the community effort of everyone kind of jumping in and, and, and helping, or you can ask questions and someone's there, or oftentimes it's the developers that are in the Slack channel as well, because they're totally. leaning from people. Yeah. I, I love yeah. that. That energy is great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, I think, especially for early stage stuff. Like that's that's really mm -hmm. key because 
even if you don't think of yourself as contributing to open source, just by right. asking questions about how this stuff is working, you are contributing, right? Because right. I spend so much time working on Spark that there are just things that I don't see anymore, right? And right. It's, it's only when people come and ask me questions, I'm like, oh, yeah, this makes no right. sense at all. We mm -hmm. need to fix this, right? Right, like, right, right. Um, and and it's it's just super easy to get into this mindset of like, oh oh sorry my my dog has decided that he wants to eat a box. Uh, oh, that's okay. Boxes are recyclable, so that's good. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> sorry, I just wanted Looks to like make sure. That one, oh yeah, we'll definitely check on that. Um, we got a question from the community. They want to know sure. if Python is the future of programming. What's your thought on that? <sighs> I mean, I I don't. How would I say this? So I'm I'm very biased, right? So like this is very much my personal view, but I think that the future of programming is not one specific language. Yes. I think that our future is one where our tools are able to work together regardless of what language like they're written in. Yes. And I think that this is really important. Um, and so like I think that that Python has an amazing set of libraries and community built up around mm -hmm. machine learning. I think it's it's a fantastic language. Um, but honestly, there are things that Python is not great at, right? And that's, right. that's okay. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the solution to that is not trying to fix Python, is trying to make Python work better together in yes. an ecosystem of different tools, right? Like, right. Um, and, and and I think that's really cool. That being said, like I think that we are going to see more and more things being built in Python, um, mm -hmm. especially now that Python two is finally gone. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it I I am so so I have got so much old code that I'm going to delete. I'm so excited for this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think it's great, and I, I think it takes us back to that first topic that we spoke about playing well together. So yeah. one language is not going to be completely exclusive, and and the end all solution to every technology fix that we're trying to make. So it's collectively working together, and you know, I think at this point, I think we may be at time. Although I could probably talk about this for another hour or so, but I want to thank you so much for sharing um, all of your insights and experiences in the space. Oh, thank thank you for having me. It's been, it's been yeah. lovely to chat. Yeah, great, so much. Let's see. Hello, uh, well, Hi. it was super. Hi. It was super hey. interesting to hear your thoughts, uh, you know, all the way from Ray and Dask and Apache Spark and how it connects mm -hmm. to machine learning and right. building data pipeline and building machine learning pipeline. Uh, and also, is the future is only in one language or should we right. aim for, you know, more of a domain that we want to gain expertise in? So right. it was definitely illuminating and fun. Uh, Thank you so much, Holden and Cheryl. It was lovely yeah. to have you with us. Uh, Thanks hopefully for we'll us. see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Um, and if you want to ask questions or learn more, you can always follow Holden and Cheryl on their Twitter and also join our office hours on the dev.2, the box right there at the bottom. So you can scan it and ask all the questions uh, you would like to ask them.